The third case is the uh, Troop K case just spoken of with the death of Ana Lopez. There are three additional cases and they're being investigated by the uh, New York City Police Department, which you're aware of. Uh, on 513, they recovered a body in an oil drum in northern Brooklyn. Uh, yesterday, uh, a body was recovered under a mattress near JFK Airport. And uh, the eighth one, the, the final one for New York City, is the uh, Jenny Soto case. Jenny Soto's mother and sister were also at the courthouse. Soto's body was found in the Bronx in November of last year. Her sister said she wanted to see the look on Rifkin's face as he came into court and wanted also to learn more about the case against him. We want to know what's going on, you know. There's more to it than he's just being caught. What's happening, you know, what's going on with the case? In February of 1989, a heinous act was being committed in a home in the East Meadow section of Long Island, New York. The life of a young woman was taken, taken at the hands of a monster who had nothing but one goal, to make women suffer. Her body was dismembered, her limbs being scattered throughout the tri-state area, and her head was found on a golf course somewhere in New Jersey, the rest of her body thrown into the East River. These were the remains of a woman who wasn't identified until 2013. Her name was Heidi Balch, the first woman to lose her life at the hands of a man named Joel Rifkin, one of New York City's most notorious serial killers. The city of New York would have no choice but to watch as more and more bodies turned up, and authorities had no idea who was responsible. But along with the media frenzy that ensued, much like with other killers like Gacy, Dahmer, and Berkowitz, papers and news outlets all over the city were quick to label these victims, and the story became less and less about them and more and more about the monster who took their lives. And for one family, the constant misjudgment of their loved one would lead to more and more pain and obstacles to overcome. Today on Evil Intentions, the story of Jenny Soto. She was born to her mother, a Puerto Rican woman named Margarita Gonzalez. Margarita was born in Puerto Rico, but would move to New York at just five years old, becoming used to the Big Apple. Jenny's immediate family consisted of her mother and six or seven siblings, depending on your source, siblings who she adored. She was the third child. Jenny would never get a chance to meet her father, this being because tragedy struck this family early on when he was stabbed to death in a Brooklyn train station in 1968, just a few months before Jenny was born. His killer was never found. Jenny and her family would first reside in the East New York section of Brooklyn, New York, before moving over to Park Slope. Jenny was described by loved ones as a lively child full of personality and life, a typical happy child in a lot of ways. She loved to run around and play with her friends and siblings. She loved to dance and she loved playing with dolls as she was often gifted. Jenny knew both English and Spanish, having grown up in a Puerto Rican household. The neighborhood at the time, a huge melting pot of different ethnicities and cultures. A neighborhood that housed Latinos, African Americans, whites, and Asians, just to name a few. She attended Junior High School 51, followed by John Jay High School, both in the Park Slope area, where she made plenty of friends and she was well liked. As Jenny grew older into her teen years, she was starting to come into her own and becoming her own person, and those around her who loved her the most loved the person that she was becoming. Jenny could often be found in her family's apartment in the living room with friends and relatives. They would talk about the latest trends, music, and life. They'd take turns doing each other's hair, something that Jenny was great at. They would take out a bunch of clothes and try on different things together, and do each other's makeup for pictures. According to her mother, no matter what the latest hair trends were, Jenny knew exactly how to replicate them. Jenny always took fashion advice from her sister, Jessie. Jessie is who would keep her in the loop, and she was hip to the best fashion. They were close. Those around Jenny knew exactly how talented she was. They believed in her when she had dreams of becoming a hairstylist and model, and she believed in herself. She knew that if she really wanted it, she could make it happen for herself. She wanted to be the next Cindy Crawford. She was very photogenic and loved being in front of the camera. If given even the slightest encouragement, Jenny knew how to transform into model mode and steal the moment. Even though Jenny herself only stood at 5'2", 
Her confidence was as tall as it could get. Jenny had really big dreams for herself, dreams that she wouldn't have a proper chance to pursue. But while she was here, she had a strong impact on those who were fortunate enough to get to know her. According to sources, at some point between the 11th and 12th grade, Jenny would drop out of high school. In the years that followed, Jenny would experience a lot of good times and also a lot of rough patches, moments that would be hard for anybody to overcome, let alone a young woman who was still trying to figure out who she was. When it came to music, Jenny was a fan of hip hop and disco among other genres. She loved attending all the coolest hotspots where she would meet many others like her who loved the nightlife. Popular nightclubs like the Ritz, Palladium, and Emerald City, where she would dance the night away. She loved dressing up and looking her best when she went out, whether it was short shorts or designer pantsuits, paired with accessories like her bamboo earrings or gold front tooth, her hair in a French twist. Jenny knew how to dress to impress. She held several part-time jobs and was a very independent woman. But some point before dropping out of high school, Jenny was introduced to drugs and would face troubles with substance abuse. According to her family, this began when Jenny started to spend time with a certain group of friends who introduced her to drugs and an ex-boyfriend who was no good for her. She would find herself in trouble with authorities when she was arrested on different occasions, once for sex work and another two times for drug charges. Jenny was living a fast-paced life, but she was also determined to get her life in order. She would check in at the Kings County Hospital Detox Center in an attempt to get herself in order and start with a clean slate. According to her loved ones, Jenny was doing exactly that, getting her life in order. She no longer wanted to spend time with those who'd introduced her to the dark side of New York City's nightlife. She began spending time with her sister more often, and they'd remain as close as ever. Things were looking up and she was working toward getting her GED. She later met a man that her family described as being a good match for her. Someone who showed her that there were other things that she could spend her time doing that didn't involve drugs or partying. His name was Noel. He was an aspiring rapper who went by the name of Popcorn. Jenny would often say that he was the greatest thing that ever happened to her. The two had dreams of becoming parents and were very much in love by all accounts. She would often accompany him to the studio sessions and here, a new passion came about. After spending so much time in the studio with Popcorn, Jenny began to get inspired. And here, she learned that she really wanted to try her best to be a producer. She wanted to help produce music for a group that her brother was a part of. But on November 16th of 1992, Jenny and her sister Jessie were returning from Popcorn's home in Bushwick, Brooklyn. Jenny and Popcorn had a small fight, and so she left the home upset with her sister. They would end up at the Delancey Street train station on the Lower East Side when Jenny received the beep on her pager. Jessie recalls her sister Jenny letting her know that she could continue to go home because she was going to stay in the area. She had something to do or some friends to see. But Jessie had no idea that this would be the last time she would ever see her sister alive. Jenny, who'd been very much used to the nightlife and being independent, would often spend time away from home, whether it be with friends or over at her boyfriend's house. So her family and friends not hearing from her for as long as a week or sometimes more wasn't unusual. It was pretty normal. But this was mid-November, a time where many are preparing for holiday feasts and time with their families. So when the Thanksgiving holiday came and went, and there was no communication from Jenny, the family began to worry. They assumed that maybe she was with her boyfriend. But then, he too would call her family, asking them where she was. And those worries quickly turned into fears. Weeks felt more like years as the family and friends of Jenny would search as hard as they could for answers on where she might be. Jenny's mother was, of course, fearing the worst and hoped for the best outcome, and the rest of the family would convince her to report Jenny missing on December 1st of 1992. But just later that night, police visited the household to deliver tragic news. The lively, loving, and beautiful Jenny Soto was dead. As the family struggled with the news, the details that followed would only make the wound much deeper. Jenny's body was found washed up on the banks of the Harlem River on 132nd Street and Lincoln Avenue. She was found under a Newport sign, a sign that would glimmer on and off throughout the night as drivers traveled along the Bruckner. Jenny was found wearing only an orange and red striped shirt and nothing else. Her neck bore signs of trauma, indicating that she had been strangled with some sort of cord or string, later found to be nylon. Her face was black and blue, and her body had multiple injuries from what looked like a struggle, and her body tumbling down the rocks into the water. All her jewelry and her identification were nowhere to be found. This discovery was made just three weeks before Christmas. While others were planning holiday get-togethers, 
Jenny's family would soon be planning a burial. While her name could never in a million years be forgotten by those who loved her most, before she was identified to authorities, Jenny was one of the many Jane Doe's in the city. She was identified when her sister was contacted, after police matched Jenny's fingerprints to previous police records in Albany, since she had been previously arrested there. Jenny's family were understandably distraught at the news, and were now forced with a long wait as authorities tried to figure out who might have been responsible for doing this. It would be another seven months before they got answers. During the early morning hours of June 28th of 1993, State troopers were traveling down the Southern State Parkway in Long Island when they spotted a 1984 Mazda pickup truck without a license plate. Police tried to pull this driver over, but he would continue driving, taking the police on somewhat of a chase, but for most of the time, he didn't go above 50 miles per hour. It was as if he was toying with the cops, or as if he wanted to be stopped. The pursuit would last about 20 minutes before the driver ran a stop sign and crashed into a utility pole in Mineola, Long Island. A 34-year-old man was behind the wheel and was cuffed after the crash. It would take but a few seconds before one of the troopers smelled a foul odor coming from the man's vehicle. He would use his flashlight to check what was inside when he noticed a blue tarp. One of the officers would pull the tarp to reveal what was under. It was the badly decomposed body of a woman named Tiffany Bresciani, originally of Louisiana, a young woman who moved to New York City to pursue an acting career, and the man in cuffs with her body in his truck was a man by the name of Joel Rifkin of Mineola, Long Island, an unemployed landscaper, a sick individual with darkness deep inside of him, a monster whose daily life consisted of gardening with his mom and taking photographs of people who had no clue how sick he was. He would tell the troopers that the woman in his truck he had killed and she was a sex worker, a sex worker that he met near the Williamsburg Bridge on Allen Street. She had already been dead for days when he was caught. Her body transferred from an orange wheelbarrow in his mother's home before putting her in his truck. He was on his way to go dump her body at Republic Airport in Farmingdale. While this was shocking to say the least, the officers would find themselves in disbelief when after two hours of questioning finally led to them breaking Rifkin, who would then let them know the horrible truth. There were more, many more. For years, bodies of young women who had been involved in one time or another in sex work began to pop up all over the tri-state area. Without knowing it, police found themselves face to face with a serial killer. A killer who had no trouble telling them exactly what he did to each of his victims. He spoke candidly about having sex with his victims, strangling them, bludgeoning them, and in some cases, dismembering them, leaving their body parts scattered throughout the tri-state area, leaving their bodies stuffed in steel drums. He mentioned how easy some of them were to kill. Sometimes he stared out of the window as he took their lives. Others, he stared into their eyes so he was the last thing they ever saw. In total, Rifkin would be connected to 17 murders, mostly women that he had picked up on the street looking for sex. Not only did he confess to the heinous acts, he kept souvenirs. He had Jenny's wallet in his home, along with a metal safe. The safe contained 48 pieces of jewelry that he had collected from the women he murdered. Jenny, who had spent time on Allen Street when she was a sex worker, would cross paths with Rifkin some time after leaving her sister. He told police that Jenny was the hardest to kill. She fought him tooth and nail, taking Rifkin's DNA with her as she punched, scratched, and screamed as hard as she could. He then savagely murdered her, got in his vehicle, pulled over on the FDR, and tossed her onto the rocks and into the water, taking the life of a woman who was on the path to bettering herself. The media frenzy would go on to make a spectacle of Rifkin's heinous crimes, but as often is the case, the attention was put mostly on the sorry excuse for a man that committed the murders. The women who fell victim and became trapped in his sick, sad world were only addressed as quote-unquote prostitutes. If 17 girls were brutally murdered in 2022, and they all had OnlyFans profiles, or were exotic dancers, or slept with men for money, would we all be so quick to label them as such? Or maybe the better question is, what gives anybody the right to take someone's life because of what they choose to do with their bodies? What gives media outlets the right to address these women as less important than anyone else? Why? Because of sex and drugs? It doesn't give anyone a right to judge. People who might have lost their way in life or struggle to get on the straightened path should have every chance to try and turn their lives around. That chance was snatched from Jenny by violent means, and she deserved much better than that. They all deserve much better than that. Heidi Balch, Julie Blackbird, Barbara Jacobs, 
Mary Ellen DeLuca, Yoon Lee, Lorraine Orvieto, Marianne Holman, Iris Sanchez, Anna Lopez, Violet O'Neill, Mary Catherine Williams, Jenny Soto, Leah Evans, Lauren Marquez, and Tiffany Bresciani. Every last one of the names that I mentioned were much more than what any newspaper or news report could ever describe. They were daughters, sisters, friends, lovers, and mothers. Whatever paths they traveled in life, it's nobody's place to judge. They should still be here to tell their own stories, since so many failed at doing so and chose to highlight the life of a complete lunatic instead. Someone with no goal of life but to inflict pain on innocent women. He was the one that should have been thrown into prison for the rest of his life and given as little attention as possible once he confessed. 30 years later, articles still appear with his name as the headline. He was sentenced to 203 years in prison, where he still lives and breathes today. Jenny left behind many, many friends and family members who still mourn today. People who loved and cared for her unconditionally. On top of the pain of dealing with such a heavy and sudden loss, they were forced to relive every heartbreaking moment every single time they picked up a paper or a magazine. Forced to read how these people labeled their beloved Jenny. She wasn't defined by her past or mistakes she might have made along the way. She was human. She was loved. And more importantly, she's always remembered. Rest in peace, Jenny Soto, and my deepest condolences go out to her friends and loved ones.